What's going on, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Designated Players Podcast. This is episode 152. It was a crazy week of MLS games this past week. I believe this is week nine. And it's time that we talk about some coaches, specifically the coaches that are in the hot seat. I got a list. Connor's got a list. We're going to sit down and we're going to talk about if they should be there, if it's harsh, why we think they should be there, or why we would defend them if, if people think they should be. So thanks for joining us. We hope you are ready for a great episode. Uh, Connor, how you doing? I think it's a bold statement that you think I have a list of coaches I, I think are on the hot seat, I have to say. I think you need to do better preparing. Well, I wasn't given a script ahead of time, so I don't know what you want me to say. I want you to say all about the coaches that you think are on the hot seat. Okay. okay. I think is that is that good enough? I think that Whoa, 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 whoa. What are you doing? <laughs> How long have you been on this show? I'm Before jumping the gun. I'm already I'm jumping. We're not the allowed to jump the gun. But my list is really good. Your list is great. What I want to know really is what is the list around your neck, aka what is scarf are you wearing this week? It doesn't matter. All right. All that matter. matters is that Ben Olsen is not on my list. And that's the only thing that matters. And we should just end the episode on that. Tell me your scarf for the week, damn it. Uh, in the theme of coaches on the hot seat, this is, I don't know why this is upside down. Because you're bad at scarves. <laughs> no, it's its upside down. Like, they've printed one side upside down. It's the Toronto scarf. You're a loser. Spoilers. But, like, look, look, if I just turn this around, like, this way, it's upside down. Who designed this? <laughs> Oh, you, I'm the loser. I went first. So you, yeah, copied you me. always go first. I'm also rocking a Toronto. I had my scarf before you did. You, no, I saw, you didn't. I watched you stare at the wall. No, you didn't. <laughs> Connor is a copycat. We are both talking about Mr. Bob Bradley in Toronto being on the hot seat. So why don't we just start right there? I think this one isn't getting enough attention personally. I mentioned it on Twitter yesterday. And I think a lot of people agreed with me that, you know, there's, there's a lot of, uh, Peter Vermees, there's a lot of Gerard Struber, but not enough Bob Bradley in this mix. The highest wage bill in the league, all their DP slots filled to my understanding, two of the most talented players in the league that make the most money, back-to-back years at the bottom of the East. It's just not good enough. He was brought in to turn this team around after they went flat under Greg Vanny after the treble year. And they have given him every single bit of support that is needed from the front office to get that done. He's got players. He's got the the infrastructure. He's got everything that he needs. And he's, he's just falling flat. I think it might be, I think it might be time for a change. I I was going to say something more, but I think I'll just leave it there. Yeah. I think in fairness to him, the team is still very new. I'm looking at the list of new players that came in. I mean, it's a huge list. It is a massive list of players that just came in. This team needs some time to gel. And Senior has been out basically the entire season so far, who is one of their, you know, two star players, as you mentioned. I think he's I don't disagree that he's on the hot seat, mainly because he the team was so bad last year. But I think he needs more time. This team needs some time to work on chemistry. Uh, this is basically like a brand new team, honestly. I know there were a number of these guys that were here last year, like Bernadeschi and Insigne, who were here for a bit. But there's so many new faces in the team as well. I mean, there's like, obviously, Sean Johnson and Matt Hedges came in in the offseason, Rustad as well. I mean, there's a lot of guys who are starting. They came in in the offseason. They, I think they need some time to gel together. Insigne's back. Give him a bit more time. But, I mean, if the form continues throughout the majority of the season, then yeah, you probably got to like cut your losses at some point, you know, especially if Toronto still have a shot at the play in late in the season, then you definitely like swap it because this team is too talented to be missing out on a playoff spot where your nine teams make the playoffs. Well, and that, that's my, that's my worry too. Last year, they, they looked exactly the same as they did last year. And last year they were almost the worst team in the league behind a DC United. My question to you now, if you're talking about a new team and they, they can't get a pass, blah, 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 
why does Bob Bradley get a pass and Wayne Rooney is doing everything that he can? If Wayne Rooney was in the spot, would you still give him a pass? Yeah, Wayne Rooney would have been in the job for like two months. I'm not going to sack him. Well, and that's my months. point, right? So you're you're acting like he hasn't been here already. This isn't a brand new team. He's got more start, more different starters. But this isn't a, a team. His entire midfield's still the same because he refused to bring in more midfielders. So the most important part of your, your team still remains. You have Bernadeschi, who's supposed to be one of your big playmakers that can make everything work. And you've gotten the same results as you did last year. I, got, I don't think I don't think it's good. I don't think it's he needs more time. He hasn't been here two months trying to get this thing together. He has been here a year and a half and has yet to put this together. It's not he good. Absolutely, he absolutely deserves more time. His you mentioned the midfield is the same, sure. The entire back line is completely different this year. Left back, both center backs, and the goalkeeper. Brand new. Weren't here last year. That's a mm-hmm. complete overhaul in the back line. Not to mention that right now, Toronto is, first of all, one win off of a playoff spot. They have nine points. Nashville has 12 points and six. One win, they could potentially jump all the way up to six. Like, it's tight. They have two losses on the year. They're just, they're not finding ways to win games right now, but they're not losing either. And I think, and this is without Insigne for the entire year. I mean, Insigne is supposed to be MVP level uh in this league why do you why would you not give him more time he's got his mvp type guy back the team has continuously been competitive in games they've been missing that last piece and i think it's is that last piece of the puzzle the defense will get better as the season goes on they get chemistry and i think toronto will move up the standings but i think switching out the coach now would be a mistake they built this team around bob bradley give him some more time no, they didn't. They built this team around Insigne and Bernadeschi. Bob Bradley did not get the team built around. Well, he was the coach. He was the coach when they brought you. Don't in. build a team around a coach. You let the coach build the team. I meant they were building the team while Bob Bradley was in charge. I'm sure Bob had sway in who else they brought in to support Bernadeschi and Insigne. I highly mm-hmm. doubt Bob was just kept in the dark on everything. So they've got one win in nine games. It's because they're tying every game. They have six draws okay, in nine okay, games. Okay, 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 okay. You know who else has one win in nine games? And I guarantee you is both, and on both of our lists, Jared Struber at Red Bull. What's the difference? The difference is that Red Bull didn't completely change their team like Toronto did. Okay. That's the only thing you're going with is the fact they replaced a couple of players. Yeah, I'm not saying Bob shouldn't be on the hot seat, but I don't think that he should be gone right now. Okay, okay, that, that's what I needed to hear. The way that you had phrased it to me was like, oh, no, he's he's not there. That's the way that I had assumed I had heard it from you. Well, you didn't listen because I said that he should be on the hot seat, but I don't think he's, like, heavy on the hot seat. He needs no, more the way, time. No, the way that you said it to me was well, because you don't listen. he needs more time. He's not on the hot seat. So he does I, more time, I, but he is I on heard, the I heard it as when you said he needed more time, it was more time before you even heat up the seat. No, the seat is hot. The seat is definitely hot. But he I'm needs still more mad time. at you. I still don't like you, but like that he makes needs, it. He still. I think he needs like months more time, like at least halfway through the season before you can make that call. Are we are we talking at midway point? If they're not in a playoff spot, he's gone and they're going somewhere else. Depends on where they are. If they're still like things are super tight right now. If it was this tight, like a win could jump them easily into a playoff spot and they happen to be outside of a playoff spot, I probably would still give him a bit more time. I mean, one win right now, he jumps up easily into playoff contention. Literally all it takes is a good run of form and they could lock in a playoff spot. So the the way that I look at it, again, with the tables being as tight as they are, it's not a are they in playoff position or not. It's the level of play that is expected out of them at this point in the season that I don't think they're getting. I don't think that they're getting the level of play that they expect out of, I think, Osorio's underperforming. I think uh, Diamande hasn't even played. He's been, he's been that – I don't know if he's hurt or he's been bad and not starting, but um, – 
Bernadeschi has been the only relative bright spot in that team. I know Insigne has been hurt. He came back. He scored a goal in a 4-2 loss to, to Philly. They looked awful yesterday. Like, some of that stuff isn't, oh, the, the defense hasn't figured it out yet. In 10 games as a professional, if you can't figure out what your center back partner is doing, you're not a professional. So it's, it's not just a new, new player thing. It's a system thing. And again, I haven't watched Toronto super duper in depth. But there's something wrong there systemically that is is way bigger than just, oh, a couple new players. And I, I truly think it starts at the fact that they've got four center mids, two of them over the age of 32, and they're trying to run them for 33,000 minutes a season. And it's putting way too much pressure on the back line. They don't have an attack to take it off because Insigne has been hurt, yes. Their striker situation is brutally bad um diamande like we mentioned hasn't played um akinola getting minutes question mark uh i think some i think it's been six like appearances yeah, six for... appearances one start so akinola's not getting in the mix he was we were fighting for him to be on the national team at one point yeah they're in if you're not the, uh, getting COVID the year. Yeah, if we're not getting the return out of the players that we expect this team to do it, do the eyes turn to the coach? And that's a that's an argument that goes through a lot of the coaches on this list. Is it's not it, it's the player's fault until it isn't right. Coaching, you're required to have more than just a game plan, right? You need to have players who want to play for you. You need to have control of the locker room. You need to understand tactical changes, which I think Bob does. But if your players aren't going to play for you, if they're going to give up four goals a game and just walk around with their heads down, it, it might be time. It might be time for a flip-flop. I still think that's harsh. I know they've conceded. that Their defense hasn't been great. That's clear. They've conceded the joint third most goals in the league. But there's two teams right now who conceded 13 goals a season and are in a playoff spot. If Toronto is in that spot, we're probably not having this discussion about Bob Bradley. Those two Fair. teams, by the way, Philly and D.C. We clearly Fair. are not talking about Jim Curtin being on the hot seat, even though Jim Curtin uh, is certainly not getting the best out of his seat. team. Obviously, Jim Curtin is not on the hot seat. Um, and D.C., who's an eighth, also conceded 13. Toronto has just as many goals as those two. Philly has 14. D.C. has 11. Toronto has 12. They could easily be in that spot, and we wouldn't be talking about Bob Bradley. A couple of Games, definitely one thing, one or two things go right for Toronto and all of a sudden they're in a playoff spot. So I think, I don't think this Toronto team is bad. I think the defense has shown some potential this season. There was a stretch of five games where they kept three clean sheets. Like the potential's there. It just seems like they have games where they switch off. Three against DC is not good. Four against Philly is not good. But that's more than half their goals in two games. So yep. I think there's potential. Bob needs more time. Let the defense figure things out. I know All right. you said they have to be professional and figure out center back partnerships and whatnot, but there's a lot of factors. I feel like there's language barriers. There's like, I feel like a number of language barriers across that's that. Back that's line. everybody's team though. But they have time to figure it out. They do. They do. And, and it's not hard to get into those playoff spots. I'm not saying that, but. This is a team that won a continental treble just five years ago, six years ago, right? That, that is the level that I think this team needs to be at, and that's why I don't think it's good enough. Whether they sneak in or not, it's a level that they are not playing up to. That, that is what's driving this, this conversation for me. Um, but I, I agree. Let's give them some more time. I think, I think you won me over. Give them some more time. We'll chat about it. And we'll go from there. Who's on your list that we haven't talked about? I mean, do I hit the obvious ones or do we just skip those for now? I want you to talk about whoever you want to talk about. Okay. Um, I'll go with the... Uh, I'll go with the blatantly obvious one. Uh, Peter Vermees is definitely on the hot seat. Probably the hottest seat of any manager right now because SKC looked dreadful. I mean, they just 
they have no wins this season. The only team with zero wins at this point. They have three goals scored in nine games. This just feel it feels so much like when Bob Bradley was in charge at Swansea, when uh, they just didn't score goals, didn't win games, and Bob was out within like half a season. I think considering Vermees had a full year last year where this team was also a disaster, um, his seat has got to be scorching hot. And I don't want to fully put the blame on him because I feel like his team is just always hurt. Like his star guys are supposed to be Polito and Garikinda. And I feel like they've barely played over the last two seasons because they're just always injured. Uh, but it's not like SKC having given them guys to succeed. They've spent the money. They brought in the players for them. Uh, Eric, Tommy, Willie, Agata, Polito, Kinda. I mean, they try. I'm not saying that they definitely don't try. Uh, but considering the results that they've gotten so far this season, I can't imagine Vermees lasts much longer. So I, I, a lot of people scream for his head, and I'm one of them. I'm absolutely there with you. He's been very, very good for a long, long time to this league as a player and as a coach. But your your stats were perfect. You can't you can't have those stats and and survive. Here's here's what people I think aren't talking enough about. In 2018, top of the West. 2019, second to last. 2020, top of the West. 2021, third. 2022, bottom. 2023, bottom. There are moments where he can be brilliant, and I think that is why he's still here. Because, as you mentioned, his his big players are hurt. But there's there's a time where you need to get more out of a group of players than just your top. And I think that's what he's failing to do. And it, and it really, it comes back to the idea of the off season moves. And we talked about this, their off season decisions this year were to bring back two players that are what? 34 and 36 from the glory yeah. days and, when they were in Fontas too. It was like 32 Fontas. plus. Yep. And again, Fontas can still do the job. I mean, I know he got sent off yesterday, but he's not, he's not terrible. But the last, I mean, their their off season moves are just keeping the old guys and hoping it works. Keeping the old guys hoping it works, and then signing one or two youth guys that might might pan into something, might not. Who knows, right? These guys haven't hit on a CB two signing in years. I think their last good pairing for center backs was like twenty twelve. Pollen and Pollen and Diesel. When I can't, I genuinely outside of those two, I can't remember the last time there were two center backs in Kansas City that were like, "Oh yeah, these guys are going to be your day in, day out guys." I mean, you you rotate between Fontas Punchech and Ismiat Marine. Um, you threw, uh, I think Courtney Ford was in there at some point. I mean, there were just years and years and years, almost a decade now, probably more than a decade, where they were trying to figure out who the center backs were. Tim Melia in his prime was keeping them in it. They're married to tactics that just have not worked. It's quite clear. But he got a five-year extension last year after finishing bottom of the table. Second bottom. I think Vancouver was below them, maybe. I don't know. Was it Vancouver below them? Who was below them last year? Probably San Jose. San Jose, yeah. Vancouver was ninth. But five years after finishing bottom of the table because you were missing two guys? That's not, that's not acceptable. If I'm in KC and I'm a, a supporter of SKC, I'm rioting. I'm pissed off. I don't think he's done as a coach, by the way. I think that he still can do the job. My worry is he's too tied to an old system that wouldn't work here. And just the KC in general, right? We talked about how dangerous that KC back line was with uh, in prime Zussi, uh, Beasler, Colin, and I think it was uh, Sinovic on the other side with uh, either Jimmy Nielsen or Tim Millian goal. And it was like, oh yeah, these guys, these guys are gonna be good for a, forever. And he's just stuck to that tactic. And now it's, now it's gone. Those guys are gone. They're past their prime. Tim Millian is, is a shell of himself. And uh, it's clear every time you watch the games that he's just not there. He's not bad, but it's just not at that level. And he's, he's not willing to give new guys a new try. So it might be time that Casey and him just split, split ways. Let him go try something, go USL, go overseas. 
maybe MLS is is past you a little bit. I don't know, but I think it's I think Casey's would do well to move on. Now it, they'll probably have to eat a bunch of money because they just signed to a five year deal. <sighs> and I'm gonna double check that just to be sure. I remember it being five, but I didn't look it up. Uh, but yeah, that's my that's my thought on that. Yeah, I, I think once they move on from uh, Vermees at coach, I would imagine a lot of changes will come to this club. A lot of these guys who, you know, to their point of uh, re-signing Vermees, <laughs> just re-signed, but I would likely think a new coach comes in and probably starts to clear out this team. Reset, restart. You know, maybe, maybe they bring in some... Clearly, SKC is willing to give it a shot on bringing in players, bringing in big name players. So, I think bringing in the right coach would be massive for this team. I mean, this is a team that we know can compete at the top of the Western Conference. They're willing to spend. You know, this isn't an RSL where at best they sneak into the playoffs because they don't spend any money. Like SKC will try, and I think if they have the right coach and they get the right players, they will be up there with Seattle and LAFC competing in the West. They did sign him to a five-year deal through the end of the 2028 MLS season. That would make him a 20-year head coach at Sporting Kansas Love City. That. <laughs> With the quote that says, Peter is a superlative strategic thinker who loves to win and hates to lose. Continuously demonstrates his commitment to our ownership's objective of elevating Sporting KC as a perennial contender in a league that grows tougher and tougher every year. Well, my friend, Mr. Mike Illig, I see that's how you pronounce that. Might want to reevaluate, my friend, because he may share that commitment to try and drive there, but he's not getting it done. And a bunch of people will be committed to doing that and have different ways to get it there. So it's, it's again, I, I know for a fact that he's not going anywhere until he fails to win with Polito, Kinda. Russell, Shallowy, all on the field at the same time at 100% ready to go. If he can't do it with them, then he's gone. But until then, he's got that crutch to say, well, my roster situation is tied up because we've got all our money in DPs and all the DPs are hurt. And there's no way around that. It's just something that we have to deal with. So because of MLS roster rules, he will stick. Yeah, that's going to hurt SKC. Uh, this if they continue down that route, they're not getting anything out of this season. No. And again, this now goes back to the point of certain people who have this argument that if there's nothing punishing you for being last, what's the point? This is a really good example for those people to have a leg to stand. Because he's right. Any other, this happens in any other league in the world where finishing last means something, he's gone tomorrow. He's gone yesterday. He's gone last year. But because it isn't, he's able to lean on. Now, that's not just as easy to say as, oh, well, you know, throw in Pro-Rel and, and everything will get fixed. It's not. Because the real the real issue is the, the spending rules. Because even if there was Pro-Rel, with two DPs tied up, you can't change anything. You're not going out and spending tons of money to fix it. So, I'm not, we're not going down the pro rel route today. <laughs> we could, Tangents. but I don't want to. I don't want to. What we will do. Oh, man. Do I want to? Yeah, you do. I, you just get it out of the way. If I start screaming, just mute me. <laughs> I don't know if I can. You definitely can find a way. Just, just end the call. <laughs> yeah, I might have to do that. It's time to talk about Gerard Street. It's time to talk about the awful New York Red Bulls. It's time to talk about Red Bull out, Struber out, a lot of people out. This is completely separate from the Dante Van Zier incident, which was the first telltale sign that he should be gone. He's still here. The fans will protest. This is not what I'm focusing on. While I agree that that should have been the one and only see you later, that's not what we're here to talk about. We're here to talk about the fact that this man was bought for $2 million, maybe two and a half, if I think his incentives were met. 
from Barnsley because apparently he was great at, at getting a youth focused setting really successful in the program. Instead, he has led this team in 2023 to their worst start in recorded MLS history. And there is no sign of getting out of it. Statistically worst start, by the way. People have compared our 2009 season, which is historically one of the worst starts or worst seasons in MLS history. This start is worse than the start from that season. Our players aren't at the level that it needs to be. He is not getting them any better. And the ownership is not supporting. It's a nightmare from top to bottom. But the buck has to stop with him. Red Bull love their underlying stats of expected goals and chances created and, and pressures in the attacking third and blah, 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 blah. But what nobody wants to talk about is the fact that there are no results and no answers for bad performances. And this all comes off of last night's despicable. I'm going to use the term despicable performance against bottom of the table, CF Montreal, who were down a man for 30 minutes and we generated a single chance. We are ineffective at playing actual football when we're asked to. We are only relevant, semi-relevant, because our defenders, Andres Reyes, outside of his own goal ability, has been very, very good. Nealis has been strong. And when Cornell isn't making dumb 15-year-old goalkeeper mistakes by coming out of his box and not talking to anybody, he's one of the best in the league. No question. There is not an ounce of attacking creativity or understanding of a, of a system, passing patterns, movement, no penetrating runs with the ball. I was watching this game yesterday, and every time the ball gets swung from left to right, people just stand there. Nobody is trying to make these penetrating runs to open space and create chances. We're just standing. Lewis Morgan in 2022 was like Harry Potter's invisibility cloak. But instead of Harry Potter being under the invisibility cloak, it's Gerard Struber's garbage tactics being under Lewis Morgan's wonder goals. He makes something out of nothing consistently. And he was the only reason this team found any success in 2022. It was very clear that we were overachieving out of our mind year. Struber is tactically inept, by the way. We're, we're sitting there with a man up on the worst team in the league, one of the worst teams in the league, and he just doesn't do anything. He made one sub in the, in the middle. He only took players off when they got hurt. There was no change in the system, and there was no expl explanation why. The worst part about it, as I mentioned, was the fact that we have no idea what we're doing when we get to the attacking third. When you watch certain games, a lot of it is played in transition, but there are times when the ball gets into the attacking phase and you hold it and you're creating chances. You're moving players, you're moving pieces, trying to get in. Here is a list of all the goals that we have scored, all six of them, by the way. Minnesota, off a corner kick. Columbus, a rebound goal on a counterattack where we were down a man and got lucky that somebody swung and missed. And then across from Tolkien to Van Zier to score. Charlotte, the defender missed his trap. It went over his foot and Elias Manuel tucked in to score. San Jose, we scored on a set piece. Houston, we scored on a set piece. And we got shut out against many other teams. We have one legit goal from open play. Maybe two if you count the uh, counterattack goal. This hasn't been a death row. This hasn't been like New York City, Atlanta, Cincinnati, New England. Seattle, St. Louis, Elliot. Like we didn't, we haven't played the top five teams in every conference. We played Montreal, played Charlotte, Orlando, Nashville, Columbus, Atlanta. That's not like it's not ridiculous to think that we should be getting and San Jose that we should be getting results out of those games. It's not, but here we are sitting here clueless. All we do whenever this stuff happens is change shape and hope it works. If you watch that game yesterday, every time they lost the ball, instead of fighting it back, like Jesse Marsh's system, anytime the ball was turned over, nine guys are fighting to get it back because they believed in his system. They believed in what it meant. We lost the ball. 
And everybody just tossed their hands up and said, oh, man, that sucks, and walked back, leaving it two-on-one, three-on-one, three-on-two. The guys don't want to play for him anymore. They don't play for the badge. They don't care about it because they know at the end of the day, they're just either getting dropped to USL or they're getting sold somewhere else. This is the problem that comes from Red Bull Global. And I've, I've had this whole thing planned out, but there are three main levels. The players aren't good enough. We don't spend money on players in the middle of our roster. The middle of our roster is made up basically of a bunch of homegrown players who are bang average at best. We swing and miss on all our DPs. Our coach doesn't have good enough tactics and doesn't understand how to make changes when he needs to. And at the very top of it all, Red Bull Global does not care about us. The way you fix this is Red Bull out. Red Bull leaving, having somebody who comes in with a proper idea and wants to spend the money and not turn us into a feeder club. That's the way it goes. But because that will never happen, Struber has to go. It needs to stop somewhere and it has to stop with a head coach who has been leading us to the worst start in recorded history. I yield my time. Yeah, Struber out because, as you said, he's lost the locker room. I think this Montreal game, if any game, says that the most. I mean, I don't clearly there. This Red Bull team at the start of the season, you'd say they would mop the floor with Montreal. You tell that you tell them that Red Bull is going to be up a player for 30 minutes as well. You'd be like, oh, it's going to be a blowout. It's not even going to be close. And yet you lost. They lost. Not even that, you lost in the period where you were up a man. You got outscored in the period where you were up a man. It's clear that the players either don't buy into the system or don't buy into him, and that he's completely lost the locker room. This team is just going to spiral continuously until they make a change. I don't know if the locker room loss is related to the Van Zier incident. I would imagine... It has to be, at least in some way, shape, or form. I don't know if it's the sole reason, uh, but it certainly accelerated it. I don't think the players trust his system. I don't think they like him. Uh, I feel like I remember even BWP talking about this on 360. And I think he said something along the lines of, yeah, I wouldn't want to play for this guy right now. And I can't imagine that that is... Far-fetched to say that there are plenty of guys in the Red Bull locker room that feel the exact same way. I don't know why Struber isn't out already. He should have been after the whole Van Zier incident. Uh, but if the results aren't an indicator of that even more, I don't know what is keeping Struber here at the moment. I, he should be gone. Um, and Red Bull should really look to reassess after all of this. Reassess on the team. Reassess in the direction. But to your point, I highly doubt that will happen. I think you will continue to be a feeder club. You will continue to look to get players through the draft and through homegrown signings and just continue to be that pipeline. I mean, as long as you keep producing players like John Tolkien, you will continue to be a pipeline. Uh, that is, yeah, I, I think that Struber, is, Struber should have been out yesterday. That is absolutely correct on all parts. But here's the, here's the story I want to tell before uh, we move on. Because I'm, I'm not spending all day doing it. I could, but I'm not going to. At the end of the 2021 season, or somewhere in the middle of it, Sean Davis talked about how he would run through a wall for Gerard Stroop. It's a man you want to get behind, a man you want to want to play for. You know, he, he gets you going, he makes you going. The end of that year, he jumped ship to Nashville. They offered him a contract, he said no, and bounced. So either he was blowing smoke or he wanted a new challenge. To me, I think he was saying that just to get the, the team on his side. But he, he wasn't going to play for him either. If your captain isn't going to play for you, what's the point? What's the point? It's a, it's a bad day to be a, be a supporter of this club. It is disappointing from where we came from. I mean, look at our 2013 to 2018 was our our bread and butter, and in just five years, we've fallen off into obscurity. So hopefully something changes soon. We shall see. But give me the next name on your list. All right. Next name on my list. I'm going to skip one that 
I feel like I've mentioned before. I'm going to go for one that might be more up in the air right now. And I'll be curious to know what you think. Uh, no, actually, I'm going to skip that one for now. I'll go with the mo the one I think I've talked about before. Uh, Robin Frazier. I think pro pro probably plenty of people have had him on the hot seat as well. Colorado have struggled a lot this season. Um, they are sitting 12th place in the West on eight points, six goals scored. And this is similarly to Vermees following up a season where they finished 10th. Uh, whereas two seasons ago, they were top of the Western Conference miraculously somehow. But last season was not a good year for them. They looked poor. They played poor. This season so far, they've continued it again. Before I kind of, I mean, obviously he's on my hot seat. So obviously I think he, you know, he's up for debate on whether or not he should be sacked. Mike, I have a question for you, though, on this. Do you think that this is more so on Robin Frazier and his tactics? Or do you think it's more so on Colorado and their team building? So I don't think Colorado has a very good team, just to be honest. So, I agree with you. I think there's much more uh, of an issue in the team than there is in the coach. However, I don't think that the team that he has should be performing the way that they are. Um, I think he needs to move on from William Yarborough, personally. We talked about that. Maxo and Abubakar are a great, great pairing. Um, Gerbosh on the left with Rosenberry on the right, a proven uh, MLS right back. I just want to, I just want to pull up some, some appearance stats here. Hold on. There we go. Um, you know, so I don't think, I don't think that the whole issue of the back line. I don't think that's massively an issue. I think they've done well. Uh, Jack Price injury hurts them 100%. That's that's definitely going to hurt them. Paul Bassett's been okay. Max has been underwhelming. Um, Ralph Preso is is still young, trying to learn. You got Connor Ronan, who should be running this league. Sam Nicholson's been underperforming. Uh, Diego Rubio, we know what he can do. He's just coming off of injury, so you got to give him some more time. Uh, Cabral, we, we've talked about. I think he's underperforming. Uh, Jonathan Jordan-Lewis, a shell of himself. Barrios is the only guy who's really putting in goals right now. Uh, and Darren Yappi, who is 18 years old. So, again, it's a, it's a young team. But I think that they have the quality there to be competing better than they are. And I think that Robin Frazier has the ability to do that. Um, I'm just reading some of my notes here. Um, 10th in 2022, 12th in the league currently. He's got signings through the door. It's not like they left him with just a bunch of homegrown signs. Like I mentioned, uh, Maxo is still there. Uh, Gerbosh on the left back. We talked about the players that they needed to replace. They went and replaced them. One big injury to Price kills them, but you got Cole Bassett back. Uh, Connor Ronan, as I mentioned, coming in. They really, really, really are missing a striker, a second striker from uh, Rubio and, and Yappi just to give a different option, I think. Um, but if you're going to make all these signings and the team continues to fall short, eventually you have to turn to the guy who's making decisions. The guy making decisions is not putting the team in the best position to win and be successful. Then it's on his shoulders or her shoulders or whoever it is. They have not looked any bit impressive in two years. I don't remember a single game where I'm like, man, this Colorado team's legit. And even in the first place finish, I think we all unanimously said as soon as the season was over, this is the worst number one seed the Western Conference has seen in the day. Because they were. They they lucked out a bunch of one-nil wins and had a really, really I'm gonna say lucky for now, but um I don't think he's gone yet. Again, I think the Jack Price injury hurts. If we're gonna give um 
Vermees, that idea like, oh, you've got injuries and whatever. Then we need to give it to him too because that Jack Price injury, I mean, he ran everything there. Uh, however, I think um, I think I think they're getting warm there. If, if he can't get this team to perform, again, the window is still open. I think for a day or so, um, they really should be getting that. The uh, the uh, sorry, not that the the striker. I think they should be looking at another striker to try and, and balance things out. But at the end of the day, they just need to get a system that works. If they if this is a team they're going to have for the next few months, they need to find the system that works, and that's what matters. So, I know I just mentioned that I think Robin Fraser is on the hot seat. I do want to caveat that um, and say, in defense of Robin Fraser, I don't think that he truly deserves to be on the hot seat. I think genuinely. Well, I think he's going to get sacked. If he, if this continues, he's going to get sacked. But I don't think he should be the one to blame because this they just they don't build a good team in Colorado. I'm looking at you can you take a guess at how many DPs they've had since 2020? Fair. I think it's two. If a four. I mean really it should be like two. They've had they had Eunice Nomley for two seasons, maybe yeah. less than that. They had Zardis last year for one year. Uh, and now they have Kevin Cabral, who doesn't even start for them. Is Kevin Cabral uh, on a DP contract still? Yeah. Oh, they have, they wow. have his Galaxy contract. Oh. Uh, and Maxo, who I think will be a good DP for them. But in fairness, I mean, look at that list of DPs. That's dreadful. They don't. You have the opportunity to have three DPs on your team. One of them was a guy you didn't sign to a DP contract and you just traded for and acquired his contract. One guy was a guy you kept for one year and then left, let leave. Um, and then one is just starting with a team, so obviously you can't really judge him. Um, and honestly, I really don't remember much about Eunice Nomley, uh, which probably says more than enough right there. Uh, they, they just... They have not backed Frazier enough with this team. I think him getting first place with uh, that Rapids team is incredible. I know we, and I agree that the, that Rapids team was <laughs> not good as a one seed. And yet he still got them there. In 2020, they were also in the playoffs. Fifth place. He was in charge. 2021, first place. Way higher than they should have been. Last year, I think honestly, they just came back to reality. This is this is a tenth place roster from last season. And I think in the current season, I think they're underperforming a little bit, but I see this team probably barely in a play in spot if we're just talking roster. I just they don't they they don't have more than like one legit DP on this team, and they haven't for years. I don't think they've backed him. I think he's a fine coach. And if he went somewhere else where they actually backed him with DP players, I think he would do well. I agree. I, I do agree with that. But if you are going to hire somebody with the expectation saying, hey, we don't necessarily have the funds to give you these players, do you think you're the guy to do it? And this is completely hypothetical. I have no idea if this is how the conversation went, but my assumption is, he did not sign on without the understanding that he wasn't going to have designated players in a league that you are allowed up to. If he came in and was told, this is what's going to be, can you do it? And he said, yes, and he's not doing it. Turn the warmer. I agree that he should. He absolutely should, and he should not be punished if he was told, we're going to give you all the players you need to get it done, and he hasn't got it. Then it, then it goes higher. But if it was told that way, then then I'm thinking it's it's time to to find somebody who thinks they can do that. Granted, you will be consistently looking for somebody who thinks they can do that because nobody can actually do that. Not in this, not anymore. Yeah, that's totally fair. I think you're you're right. If he signed on with the knowledge that they weren't going to spend money and he's not getting the job done anymore, then yeah, he should be. He'll probably be fired for that. But again, to your point as well. 
they, like you said, they will be consistently looking for managers because this is not 2015 MLS anymore. You cannot keep getting away with not spending money on designated players. The top teams all the time now are consistently spending on having multiple designated players on their team. I mean, there's just really not teams anymore in this league that have players or have like at most one DP. I see one. So far, I'm scrolling through. I see one team right now with one DP. You want to know what team it is? Dead no. last in the Eastern Conference, Montreal. <laughs> I mean, there might be more. I haven't finished scrolling through the list, but I mean, Red Bull too. Red Bull don't spend on DPs. Usually they're okay. Right. That's but where I thought season, you were going with it. <laughs> this season, it's Lukinas and and Van Zier, and obviously Van Zier's, you know, probably going to be missing a chunk at least of Don't the season you. as he should. So you might as well just have Lukinas and look where that's go- going for you guys. But yeah, spend some money and you'll actually get some results, and maybe you'll get to keep a coach. For the back for those your, of, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say back your manager. I was going to say for those who are drastically loving this. Wrexham story without really recognizing the fact that they're only where they are because of all the money that they spent. Money wins football. Period. This is not the 1800s anymore where you get a bunch of good players from your local town, you train every day, and you get to go play the other people from the factory down the road and let's get at it, right? Money wins football. Plain and simple. Now, if you're using a football club to make money, hello, Red Bull, (laughs) then sure. Pay nothing. Get a great academy and go from there. But if you want to win something, you got to pay to play. Yeah, there's a reason the same, you know, three teams win the Premier League every season. It's because they're the teams that spend the money. You know, Man City wins the Premier League every season because, to their credit, they spend the money well, but they spend a lot of money. There's other teams in the league that spend money well. They just don't get to spend the level of money that Man City does. And MLS, I think, will only continue to go in that direction of you have to spend money if you want to win. I think we're at the point where we're attracting good enough talent uh, that you'll see, hopefully, more like Tiago Almada's in the league. And if you're not willing to take a shot and spend money and try to find your own Tiago Almada, you will fall behind. Yep. Yep. Completely agree there. So we completely went off on it. (laughs) <laughs> this is the hot seat episode. We went off on a roster rules tangent again. <laughs> How can you not, though? I think if you were to summarize all our episodes, it either devolves into roster rules, pro rel, or Red Bull, I would say. It's like the three things it just somehow falls into. Well, because at the end of the day, most of our conversations end up being affected by those three things, right? You're either yeah. you're either affected by your inability to spend, you're affected by your inability to be punished by going down, or you're affected by the Red Bull. Period. <laughs> or you're affected by the Red Bull. <laughs> um, I'm I'm gonna go to a harsh one. I've got two harsh ones. I, I got a couple of harsh ones. How many people do you have on the hot seat? <laughs> Good lord. <laughs> I've got three more. I got three more, and they're not on the hot seat. They're conversations about whether they should be. Okay. I'm going to start with Greg Vanny. You know. This one, it may be harsh, but I want to talk because I think really what needs to happen is the owners need to, leave, right? The owners have put them in a bad position. Being said, with their inability to understand the rules that were literally made for them. <laughs> um, but here, here's, my, here's my kicker, and this is why I'm kind of upset about it. Greg Vanny is in charge of bringing players in. Like, that's his other role in this team, to my understanding. In the interim with Klein out, I believe that is... I think that he may have just handed it over recently when they signed that other guy from LAFC. But for the last couple of months, it's been him. So the position that they're in where they're trying to get people across the line and it's not working, it's kind of on him. And he hasn't gotten it done. Now, again, that's a ridiculously tough ask. Somebody to manage a team and manage the transfers all at the same time. It's crazy. But you got your first win of the season last night in a team of Chicharito, who just came back, and I understand he's been hurt. Jovalich, who was supposed to be like his savior, who has been poor. Ricky Puj, who has been really poor. And Brugman. Jalen Neal's been good, but 
you looked at that back line as a person who was in charge of bringing in the players to make your team better. And you're like, yes, sir. Give me a back line of 19-year-old Jalen Neal, 37-year-old Caceres, 32-year-old Mavinga, and that's it. It's not, it's, you know, so he did nothing to fix it. I don't know if necessarily he should be out, but I'm wondering if I'm wondering if maybe the seat's a bit. Uh, I don't think his seat should be warm, in my opinion. I think, I still think this team has good potential as soon as they, you know, gain some brain cells and decide to just cut loose Douglas Costa already. Um, genuinely might be the worst designated player signing in history. Like, rivals Rafa Marquez bad. I might probably worse than Rafa Marquez, let's be honest. Uh, I don't know about that. Uh, Douglas Costa has been really bad. Uh, yeah, but he didn't play for Red Bull. <laughs> Fair. I forgot. We have to stick to the agenda there. Uh, I think this team is honestly on the come up. They have really talented players in this team. There are holes for sure, especially in the back line, as you mentioned. But there's a lot of good things in this team as well. Chicharito has totally found his feet in this league and is one of the better strikers. I think maybe Avelich was just in a rough spot, a rough spell. Hopefully he can kind of turn that around. But, you know, obviously Efren Alvarez, we've talked for ages about him having massive potential. Uh, Ricky Puig, we know, can be fantastic in this league. I think he was probably just in a rough spell as well. He scored last game. He's going to hopefully, maybe that jump starts him. Uh, Gaston Brugman has consistently been one of, if not the best, defensive midfielder in the league. Um, they signed the new left back. I don't know if he's started playing for them yet. Um, it's like Aude or Aude. You know what I'm talking about? The Argentinian. Yeah. Yeah. I think he has, he has massive potential. I mean, he's valued at three and a half million already. 20 years old. Um, partner him, you know, in the back line, Jalen Neal's in there too. I think they have massive potential in the back line. Get a few guys to fill that up and then you're good. Jonathan Bond and goal is solid. Vanny got this team easily into playoffs last year. I mean, they were what fourth or fifth. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I, I don't remember what year he came over if he was involved in 2021, but I mean, they just barely missed out in 2021 as well. Um, so I, I think he definitely will get more time. I don't think he's on the hot seat, but, uh, I think he's fine. I think the galaxy yeah. will be fine. I think he's fine. Yeah, to me, it was it was that was just a conversation piece. I don't think he is. I think, I, I think it was a bad start, but not having Chicharito hurt and not having, um, Puig get his best hurt. That whole that whole back line thing is still an issue. Mm -hmm. They they're only not allowed to sign international people, so they can go still find, uh, green card holders and get them get them here so um that'd be something i'd be interesting to seeing in the second window to see if they bring in and fix it because i think that's their biggest issue is that back line is brutal yeah all right um, who's next am i up you are have we talked about him already um hernan losada i don't have him on mine you don't have him on yours i don't no this will be because this will be a good topic then so the reason I don't, and I'll, I'll make it quick, then you can do your, your spiel. Sure. We're talking about how Robin Frazier needs to be given, you know, free more free reign because he doesn't have the team in place. They went out before Lasada even got in the door, sold three of their best players, replaced them with one, and just said, have fun. I don't, I don't put it on him. I don't think that. I think that they have something planned for next window or maybe even next year. And Lasada's just been told, hey, get by with what you can, then we'll get you your replacements. That's kind of why I didn't put him on. I so I just wanted to use this honestly as an excuse to talk about Montreal. Um, I don't think he should be on the, the hot seat either. I really just wanted the chance to dunk on Montreal because whoever is running this right now is just completely lost. I mean, we already talked about the fact that they sold all their best players last season and replaced it with absolutely nothing. 
And then what did they do mid season or not mid season, but what did they do like right towards the end of the winter transfer window? How about just one of the dumbest trades in MLS history? Um, we still haven't talked about it's that. It's up by there. The way. That's why it's I wanted to mention up. this. Okay. Uh, because we haven't we didn't get the chance to talk about it. We never really had the right opportunity, but genuinely, I don't know who's running the show for them, but that Kamal Miller trade, I je- I like what are they thinking? I forget who, I mean, a number of people kind of done it already, but it was something like if you valued the trade, I think it was like uh, Lasseter was like 100K or something, and Kamal Miller was like a million, and then they got like a million and three or something, and Gam as well. So it put like a 2.3 million Tam Gam valuation on camera. Uh, What's his name? Isn't that it's it's Duke. not Cameron Duke. Bryce Duke. Bryce Duke. Bryce Duke. Yeah. It, it it made him literally the most valuable interleague intra league transfer in history. Yep. Which is above insane, Paul Ariola. Which is insane for a guy who has hold on. I want to get this right. <laughs> for a guy who has played 35 times, sorry, no, a little bit more than that. 61 times in his career at the top level. 61 games. Without 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 much to prove, right? Without it's not like he played 61 times and scored 50 goals or has 35 assists. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's it's a it's a head scratcher for sure. Um now, is that something that I don't know. Maybe Hernan Lasada was like, that's a guy I want to build around. I know he hasn't done a lot, but he's young. He's got potential, and I, I like the way that he, he works. Get him for me. I'll give this. Don't think they should have given up. Come on, Miller for it. But did he come in and say, you guys have taken everything away from me and said I can build the team from scratch? So this is how I want you to start? Maybe. Right? And he didn't He didn't care. Uh, yeah, there, I mean, that's... that's... To me, it signaled that Montreal's given up on the season. They've packed it in. I don't care what transfers they make midseason. I think this team is cooked. They're done. They're this is this is again the an absolute perfect argument for the pro rail people. Uh, because they will not be punished for this. Obviously, they will be in the league next year where they can restart again. But yeah, I think they've waved the white flag already. Uh, I think Lasada is going to be mentioned with the hot seat throughout the entire season because Montreal is going to be so poor. But I don't think that he should get... I think it would be unfair if he were to get sacked because this I team agree. is built terribly. Like This is one of the worst roster builds that I've seen since I've started following this league. Yep, uh, I'm absolutely there with you. I think it'd be very, very rushed. However... Um... Yeah, I, I I wouldn't go anything crazy for it, for sure. We've been talking about this for ages. We have, because there's so many coaches that are going to be on this hot seat. My next one is one that I feel is not getting enough attention. And it's Phil Neville in Inner Miami. Two wins to start the year, and then six straight losses. Brought in Joseph Martinez, one of the league's best goal scorers, to pair with Leo Campagna, who was very good at the end of last year. This is supposed to be the duo season for them. Everybody was hyped for it. You got Drake Callender in his USMNT era, supposed to solidify the back. I was waiting for a comment there. You didn't give me about Joseph. No, about Drake Callender in his USMNT era. I, mean, I thought that was called up, so it is his USMNT era. <laughs> yeah, but that's just a funny way to say it. But you didn't, anyways. I liked it. That's why I didn't say anything. <laughs> Pozuelo was let go because Pizarro was supposed to be the man and he has been poor. I'm not saying it's time for Neville to go because the loss of Gregory is massive. I mean, he held that team together like that Terry Crews holding everything in one, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, that he, They're still trying to figure that out. Absolutely no question about it. That being said, you need to you need to think that Phil Neville being six games on the bounce without even a draw needs to be under some sort of microscope right now because it's not like he doesn't have the support from big guy Beckham. And it sounds like Messi isn't 
isn't happening to me. All the reports I'm seeing sounds like it. So it sounds like this is what he's got to work with. Better figure it out. Yeah, that's uh, one that I was maybe going to mention as well. It feels harsh because he did so well last season with the team that he had. A team that we just expected to completely finish like bottom of the East or it's towards the bottom of the East because they were still recovering from their penalty. And he got them in six and in the playoffs and they looked good. They looked promising. They signed some good, young, promising players in the offseason. They continued to build their team. They signed some, you know, proven talent and Yosef and Stefanelli brought back Leo Campagna like uh, on a permanent deal. And things have just not clicked. Maybe it's due to the fact that they signed 1,500 center forwards in the offseason <laughs> for some reason. Um, but yeah, definitely losing Gregory hurts a ton. I honestly, it's a situation where I can absolutely see him getting axed. Because I feel like this team is better than how they're playing right now. But, uh, I mean, the co- the core of good players is there. Drake Callender is playing really well. They just added Kamal Miller to partner with uh, Kirstov. I mean, Gregory's out for the season, I think, right? Or is he out for majority of the season? It was a while, I'm pretty sure. It's a it's a good amount, yeah. Yeah, but uh, from what I remember seeing, John Mutta has been playing really well. But their midfield is axed right now. I mean, there's just like nobody in the midfield. With Gregory down, there's Dixon Arroyo, who I didn't even know was on this team. <laughs> um, Victor Ujoa, Jean Mota, and Benja Kramashi, who we talked about as having high potential. Maybe this is an opportunity for him. But that's about it. That's the whole midfield. It feels like the Toronto problem to some extent, where they just don't have anybody there. Um, obviously other guys in the attack need to step up. They've been slacking tremendously considering how many good attacking players they have on this team. They have how many goals? Six. Yep. Six goals. They have almost more center forwards on the team than they have goals. Uh, Yosef or Campania. I mean, Campania was hurt for most of the season, but Yosef or Campania or Stefanelli or Jean or Pizarro, somebody needs to step up and start scoring goals for this team. But uh, yeah, I would think Neville's probably on the hot seat. I, I agree with that one. I would have, I have to say. Yep. And, and I don't think it's like a fired tomorrow type of thing, but yeah, if we get in and Messi doesn't come, which I don't think he's going to, and he can't get this right. Somebody, this team has too much talent not to. So I don't, I don't think that he lasts much longer. I mean, that's that's saying like, uh, <laughs> it's saying like he isn't best friends with the owner, right? <laughs> um, do you have one more? I've got, I've got one more. Uh, I, you go for the last one. I think we've put way too many people on the hot seat as is. <laughs> And again, as I mentioned at the beginning, it's not necessarily the hot seat. It's conversations about whether they should be or not. Okay. And the last one here, probably a little harsh. Gio Savarese in Portland. No. I knew you were going to go there with that. (laughs) I knew. All right, go ahead. I'll let you talk. 2021 MLS Cup Finals. Awesome. 2022. Missed the playoffs. Ninth place. Currently 10th in the West right now. They just don't have the bite that they used to, right? I remember Portland being as like terrifying to play against, and now it's like, eh. Is it because Valeri left? Is it because Evander has been a bust? Williamson's loss, of course, is going to hurt you. It's not perfect in Portland. I get it, but nothing's ever perfect. Everybody's got injuries to deal with. Everybody's got all this stuff to do. Your leading goal scorer is a right back, and you've got like six strikers to choose from. Now, realistically, you've got three, but there are so many on the roster that could get a chance here. You've got Frank Boley who just came in. If you if Gio Savarese does not get Frank Boley to put up 10 goals by the end of the year, I think he's gone. I think it's time for him to go. This that's very harsh in my opinion. I okay. think this we did I can't remember if it was this team or if it was a different team. 
But didn't we talk about this team being the Atlanta of 2023? And even Atlanta didn't fire Pineda in that year. But now you're talking about a guy in Gio Savarese who literally brought him brought them to the MLS Cup final in 2021 and had them in the playoffs last year. Sorry, not in the playoffs last year. They just missed out. Um, yeah, I think this team has been absolutely hit with injuries. A lot of their creative guys with a lot with experience, lots of experience in this league. Chara, Blanco, Nylos Williamson, Felipe Morris hurt. Those are key, key guys. I think the problem is in the defense. I think they built this defense terribly. I don't know the thought process there uh, when they got rid of Bill Tuoloma. But you have like you have Zach McGraw, Zuparic, and Mabiala. That's it. Those are the three center backs they have on roster. I don't think their problem is can uh, scoring goals. They have 11 goals so far. I think there's potential for more once Evander kind of figures things out and guys start to get healthy. But they need to figure out the defensive situation. And having three center backs on the roster, one of which is 35, going to be 36 at the end of the season, is not good enough. Zach McGraw can't do everything himself. They, they need help in the defense. Um, they also missed Ivacic for a number of games this season as well, which definitely hurt. So, Gio Severese should absolutely get more time. He shouldn't be on the hot seat. Uh, maybe by the end of the season we could have that discussion, but not at this point in the season. I think he, I actually think he's done well with what he's been handed so far this year. Well, and that's and that's kind of what I was kind of alluding to is right now, of course not. I'm not saying get rid of him now. At the, again, tenth in the West is still close to a playoff spot. It might even be a playoff spot. Is it nah, ten, just nine ten? I said it's eight nine, isn't, right? Yeah. So so he's there, right? Playoffs. We need to change our conversation, by the way, from playoffs being the mark of success to uh, something else. Because when 67% of the league makes playoffs, it's a little bit less of an achievement, I think. But that's a different story for another day. Um, I'm just saying that if they continue to be toothless in the attack, for lack of a better term, for a coach of Gio Savarese's quality, then it's something to talk about. That's it. Just that was a conversation. That's all. Well, I I think you're looking at the wrong area. To be honest, uh, they've. Been, I feel like they've been scoring goals fine. They could probably be a bit better, but they've scored 11 so far this year, which is like they've scored 11. That's playoff level number of goals. Their issue is they've conceded the second most goals in the Western Conference. So their their issue is that they don't have a pure goal scorer. Their leading goal scorer is a right back. Joint level with... Hold, please. It's Mosquera at right back. And then when Transfer Market decides to update for me. Dyrona Spree at right wing. You've got a center back who's got a goal. And a bunch of your center mids have a couple goals. But you've got one goal from four center forwards. Nobody stepped up to be that guy. We haven't found that guy yet in this team. And that's my issue, is that they don't have the focal point. So but even, if, to... even if they get a striker here, then what? Now we're just talking San Jose team that scores a lot of goals but concedes like 80. I'm not saying they don't need to fix the other side too, but I think that their, their issues are on both ends. You're saying I'm looking at the wrong end. I think the issues, issues are on both ends. I'm just looking at a different way to fix it. I, I think they have strikers, and I think the strikers will score goals as soon as Chara's back, Blanco's back, and Evander figures things out. I think the goals okay. will come. I think the center forwards will score. The issue is that you can't say the same thing for the back line. It's not like someone's hurt and you're waiting for them to come back, uh, or it's someone that you're waiting to kind of get up to speed and figure out the lead. The one guy that's new in the back line has been their one of their best players, Mosqueda. Well, he's not necessarily new. I'm in new to the well, Mosqueda. Oh, I thought you were talking about McGraw. No, no, no. Everybody else, Zuparic, McGraw, Mabiala, Bravo, even Ivacic, all of them have experience from at least one past season. Gotcha. So, okay. So it's not like you're waiting on someone to get back. You're not waiting on someone to adjust to the league. 
I don't see how the defense improves. I feel like they're stuck. Like this is as good as it's going to get with the defense, unless they make changes. Okay. Like I said, it, I, I'm not calling for his head. I'm just conversation. Yeah. Are we here yet? So. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for listening to episode 152 of the Designated Players Podcast. Let us know if you agree or if you disagree or if you think Connor's wrong like he always is. Stop it. No, never wrong. Um, Hope you guys enjoyed it. Make sure you're following us anywhere you get your podcast so you know that next time we go live. Uh, make sure you're following us on all forms of social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok. We're all over the place. Um, just search the Designated Players Podcast and you will find us. Uh, Thanks again for listening, and we will see you next time on the next episode of the Designated Players Podcast. See ya.